All right. Are we here? Are, are we here? Yes, I think we are. Can you guys... Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me well? I've been having microphone problems. Uh, good microphone. Can you hear me well? Oh, there's a lot of lag. There's like at least 15 seconds between I talk and you guys see it. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Awesome. All right. Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? Uh, what a week, huh? <laughs> it's, um, oh, I have to say, uh, I am, I am so thankful and so grateful about the response that this uh, stream had last week. I've received tons of, um, messages on Instagram, uh, tweets, e per even personal emails from people being thankful about what we did. Um, so I would like to, I would like to, to thank you for those words. They mean a lot to me and they help me, uh, keep doing, keep doing these things. Um, I see, I see a lot of people in the chat. Uh, <laughs> A lot of no, a lot of, a lot of people familiar from last week. Hi, how you gonna, how you guys doing? Um, okay, so um, are you guys ready for this? I I am not ready for this, uh, obviously. <laughs> I have barely had my coffee this morning. Oh, have you guys seen my coffee mug? Look, look, look. <laughs> How cool is that, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, okay. Um, a bunch of things. So, I was thinking about what to do. Um, I was thinking about what to do this week. And I think from last week, um, I think the feedback about the modeling exercise was really good. And you guys, apparently, you guys liked it. Um, and I think... I think modeling um, build, well-known buildings that are out there could be something that we could start doing repeatedly. It could become a series, etc. But there was definitely a lot of feedback about people wanting a bit more and wanting to go a bit deeper into how this, for example, the Berlin Holocaust Memorial could be modeled. Um, and there were a lot of requests about trying to replicate that modeling process that we did with Vanilla Grasshopper trying to replicate it with um, in C sharp using C sharp scripting components, which I think is actually a great idea. It's like a really nice uh, continuation of the, the two part model that we did. We could do a third part, um, which is the, the model, but written purely in C sharp with like a big fat component with all the code. So I think that's what I wanted to bring today to, to the table. Um, I would be so I guess what, I'm, what we're going to do now, I'm going to go over a couple of things, a couple of notes that I that I want to touch upon. Um, and I would like first, if you want to say hi in the chat, so because I can't really see, I can't really see who is here. On I see there's like 50 plus people, but I, I don't know really, I don't really know who you are unless you say hi. So I would like to like slowly over time get to know your names and get to know you. Uh, so if you say hi, I can like, Look through the chat afterwards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, if you want to say hi and say like, like a few words about who you are, that would be great. Uh, on top of that, um, I want to do the modeling of the Berlin Memorial in C sharp, but and then I would like to open it up for Q and A by the end of the live stream because um, I would like to hear. I would like to hear from you what um, what other things do, would you like to to see me doing this live stream? I have, a, as I said last week, I do have a personal agenda. I do want to create videos and I do want to create content that could be aggregated into playlists and could become learning material that people could do on their own. I want to use that material as well um, as support materials for the courses that I teach um, here in school. And um, so I do have some ideas about uh, like a, a, a set of like vanilla grasshopper tutorials. And I mean, there's a lot of that out there already, but um, I have my own personal opinion and my own personal take on how those things can be taught. So I, I would like to contribute that. We could probably, this is something we should definitely do, 
uh, like let's learn C sharp from scratch and then just do it like on its own without Grasshopper and then how it see how it integrates inside of Grasshopper, see how we can um, understand Rhino Common, which is the main library that runs in Grasshopper for geometry, and then see examples of developing computational tools in C sharp for other platforms, such as for example, um, I can I'm thinking Unity. 3D is a good example. Uh, we could do um, Dynamo. Dynamo BIM is a really good example as well. Um, and there's like a couple other new tools that are popping out there that I need to get a bit more familiar with, but that could be like a stretch goal in the future. Um, uh, and uh, so, but I would like to hear your opinion about what you guys think we could do. All right. So, um, unless until we have a clearer agenda, um, we could probably keep this as a conversation. Um, I see a lot of people saying hi from on the chat. I see, I see people. I see a lot of names familiar from last week. People from Italy, Colombia, India, Australia, Nigeria. Whoa. Um, I see. Oh, I see Kristen again. <laughs> hi, hi, Kristen. How are you doing, Professor Chandra? Uh, how are you doing? Uh, wow. Okay. Okay, um, and somebody's pointing at Blender as a nice platform. Um, actually, um, on top of that, on that, on that note, I wanted to I wanted to give a couple shout outs uh, to other people that I know that are doing that are currently doing live streams on computational design and that I find super interesting. The the one of them that I want to mention is Diego Pinochet. Uh, he's a PhD student here at MIT, uh, down the road from where I live. And he studied a series of tutorials on, I think it's Python coding within Blender, and then interoperability and communication with uh, Grasshopper. Uh, and he's doing like a lot of like a reaction diffusion tutorials. Oh, sorry, I'm not. <laughs> okay, I'm not, I'm not sharing my screen. All right. Yes. So I would like to give a shout out to Diego Pinochet. Uh, who has been doing a lot of really interesting work and sharing his knowledge on his YouTube channel. He has a series of Python, um, Python tutorials for Blender and, um, and, um, and he's doing this like reaction diffusion. He takes a sphere and he writes these algorithms to create a reaction diffusion pattern on top of it and then transfer that into Grasshopper so that you can bake it and you can operate with the tools that we it's very interesting. You should definitely, definitely check it out. Um, and uh, I want to give a shout out to, to Andrew Human. He also recently started a series of um, a series of tutorials. Uh, for he has like a series of grasshopper tutorials, but he's been doing live streams specifically about something that he's really good at, which is like working with um, the most um, working with grasshopper as an art tool. So coming up with ways of looking at geometry and using shaders and using um, um, techniques to using techniques to is the, is the stream frozen? Oh. Uh, and using techniques to um, to create patterns and to, to create like stroke like like artistic drawings out of out of grasshopper and then use those to feed a potter a plot a plotter machine that he has and create physical drawings out of this. Uh, it's really, really interesting. You should definitely subscribe and check it out. Um, which reminds me also, uh, for those of you who are here, you're probably already uh, familiar with this, but if you want to get notifications about when these streams go live and get an email, um, then make sure you go to my channel, make sure you subscribe here. And make sure you turn on notifications so that you get these like pop ups and these emails like, oh, the live stream is going on, etc. etc. Um, so, yeah, another thing that I wanted to <laughs> another thing that I wanted to share is last week there was a lot of conversation in the chat about uh, whether using icons and using or using text in Vanilla Grasshopper. Um, I I am a very strong advocate for icons. I think we are visual learners and I think it's easier to recognize them. It requires some training, but once you have that training, um, I think it's good. But that's my opinion. So on my Instagram, I started a poll and I asked people to vote whether if there were icons or text people. And it turns out that 
the community is pretty divided between between both so um icons are a little more popular i believe but you guys in the chat pointed out to this um grasshopper plugin that i had no idea it existed uh the bifocals plugin i'm going to pull it up here uh food for rhino food for food for rhino bifocals um which is a plugin that allows you to um, to be using icons on your on grasshopper but then have this pop-up this like tag on top of the component with the text representation of that component which i think is a really really nice idea uh, and it's a really good compromise between the two worlds so i've i thought that suggestion was amazing so i'm going to stick to using bifocals i'm going to stick to icons um, uh, during my tutorials, but I will be using bifocals so that all the icons have the pop-up and it's easier for, to read for people who are used to text in components. I want to give a shout out to Mark Sip uh, as well for making this happen and contributing this to the, to the, the community. Um, I, met, I met Mark at a conference at Smart Geometry in 2012. Uh, where is he? Yes, here. Um, I met him at a conference in Smart Geometry in 2012. We had an amazing time. Uh, and he's like a super skilled programmer and really good designer. I think he's working at Gensler right now. Um, but I haven't run into him for a long time. So I'm sending you a lot of love from here, uh, Mark. <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, but I'm happy, to, I'm happy to see all your work and, and, and to be able to use your, your contributions here in the chat. Um, Okay, uh, Angel Muñoz from Ayak, how are you doing? Uh, Shireen, good to see you. Kevin, hey, what's up? Uh, okay, uh, do, 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 do. that sounds great. Last week I mentioned about design challenges like coding challenge, parametric building. Maybe that can be a playlist. That is something that, that we can definitely talk about. I, what, what would be the name of, let's say we, we started a series which was, um, which was, um, what is it going to be? Which was like taking buildings and then modeling them in, in, in Grasshopper and then maybe perhaps modeling them also in C Sharp. What would be, what do you guys think would be a good name for that playlist? Uh, modeling challenges, parametric building challenges, um, great buildings modeled or something, parametric building models or something. Um, Feel free to drop some ideas here in the chat if you if you think. But I, I would definitely like to start that playlist. Um, all right. Okay, so let's get busy because um, otherwise I'm gonna be I'm gonna be talking for like <laughs> I'm gonna be rambling and 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 we're not gonna get the job done. So yeah, so that's what we're gonna do today. We're going to we're going to model the Berlin Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, it's going to be part three and what we're going to do is we're going to replicate everything we did last week and uh, But instead this time we're going to do it in pure C sharp We're going to write a big fat C sharp component and we're going to write all the code in line and the component is going to give us all the outputs um, Castillo challenges <laughs> Computational attack <laughs> All right <laughs> I like computational attack. Not sure if I like it for that playlist in particular, but I do like the the the. the. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So how do we get started? Um, oh, and um, and remember, uh, if you stick around, I will be around. I will be doing a round of Q and A by the end of the by the end of the stream. Okay. Um, and also, I need ideas about what to do for next week. Um, um, okay, now to t today's tutorial, I'll, I'm going to explain this. I think I, I can explain this in the video, but today to today's tutorial is going to be fully based on C Sharp. So um, because I see this video living somewhere on the channel in the future where it also is linked to this future playlist of tutorials that break down C Sharp from the beginning, I think what I'm going to do for this video is I'm going to assume 
certain familiarity with writing code in C sharp inside of Grasshopper. So I'm not going to go over the basics of like, what is a variable? How do you write a for loop, etc. But I'm just going to cut to the chase and, and like, um, start implementing the things and tapping into what is particular about like the generation of a plane and like, how do you contain points inside of a curve, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm going to assume a little bit of knowledge, uh, which I will hopefully be able to provide sometime in the future when I when I record this playlist of like learning C sharp. Okay. Another thing um, that I want to point out. Um, I've been talking, I've been talking, um, I've been thinking that um, I've been thinking that these videos and these live streams, um, I'm making them, I'm very happy to make them and I will, I want to commit to making them for as long as I can. Um, but, um, but I'm not, I'm not entirely comfortable with the fact that these videos are linked to my personal YouTube account. I guess what I'm saying with this is that um, I have some, I, I use, I, I typically have used the, my account for like my experiments and some off topic tutorials or things that I want or like videos that I shot, etc. But since I would like this project to grow over time and perhaps not be something that is just me but it may be something that can be open to other people coming in and doing more videos, etc. So I'm kind of thinking that um, I may want to at some point migrate these live streams to a different channel with its own name. So you know how Dan Schiffman has the coding train, right? So, but it's still Dan Schiffman. So I may want to keep, I may want to keep doing this, but I may want to give it like a new name and bring it to its own channel, etc. So I think when, um, I think when I have a clear idea of how does that look or where it could be, I think I would, I would make an announcement and then I, I will keep, I will keep doing these tutorials, these videos from my account uh, for a while until we all fully migrate to this new hypothetical channel. Um, I need to give that some thought. And actually I do have the videos of last week. I do have them ready to go, but I haven't really published them on my, uh, YouTube channel because I'm kind of thinking that I may just want to start directly dumping them into the whatever that new channel looks like. So, so yeah, I'm still thinking about that. If you want to, if you have opinions about that, uh, feel free to dump, to dump them here in the, in the chat and, and I will check them out at some point. Um, all right. So shall we get ready? This is going to be a lot of fun and a lot of nerding. So let's get to it. Okay. Um, um, I'm going to start by, I'm going to start by opening up where we left last week. So I, this was the file that we, that we, that we ended. I haven't even, I haven't even like cleared this spaghetti. I'm so ashamed of this. I, I just, I hate it. I cannot look at this. Guys, please do not <laughs> do not write grasshopper definitions like this. Please like group things and give them names, etc., etc. This is terrible. Okay, don't take this. Uh, don't don't look at this for me. All right, but I'm just gonna take this because it has the curves and it has like uh, the surfaces that we designed last week. So um, and I want this continuity between videos. So um, so yeah. Um, so I think we're gonna, um, we're gonna start here. Um, and, um, and I think what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to wait until the very end of the video to, and so that I have the result and I have the C sharp component and everything is done. And then I'm going to record the, like the very first bit of the video where I say like, Hey, this is what we're doing. And this is where, where we're going to get to. Um, I think I'm going to record that by the very end so that I can show the final result and then we start rolling. Okay. Uh, so if I forget to do that, can you guys please remind me <laughs> to, to record the intro part? Um, I will be very thankful. Yes. Okay. So, so how are we going to start? We're going to start by discussing, um, what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to start by saying something like, um, like, yeah, welcome. Oh, no, that, that, that will, I will do an introduction. Something like, um, 
like um like what are we going to do and what the what assumptions i'm going to do yeah i probably want to say something like that mm -hmm. okay so i'm going to turn this on <clears throat> and i'm going to start recording um where how do i start recording oh I, okay all right wish me luck <laughs> okay who who Good. So let's start with this. Um, as you may remember from the previous video, in part two, uh, what we did was we modeled um, we modeled the full monument parametrically, and then we were able to control the size and of the the size of the blocks, the size of the. I, I'm gonna start over again. I didn't like this. <laughs> okay. So I start here. Um, Okay. All right. I'm going to start again. Good. So let's get started. Um, if you remember from my previous video, uh, in part two, what we did was we extended uh, the basic principles of the monument and we, uh, uh, and we implemented a lot of new features uh, that have to do with the small details of the, of the monument. But, um, and we ended up with this file, which looks terrible and you should definitely, definitely work on grouping it and giving it some names. Okay. Um, but what we're going to do in this video is we're going to replicate the exact same, um, structure of, of, of logic for the modeling part, but we're going to do it just in purely C sharp with a big fat C sharp component. Okay. So, um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to. I'm going to use this, um, but I am just going to um, basically remove everything from here. Yes, and I'm going to save the file before I forget. Um, that's important. Okay, part three, and then I'm going to save this as um, part three. Yes, all right. Okay, so Pause. Yeah, let's pause here. Um, let me think. Is is removing everything a good idea? Is deleting everything a good idea? Yeah, yeah. Cause like otherwise it's gonna be. A... Or should I keep things so that I can go back between C sharp and the components and be like this part here is what we're going to implement now, and this logic is what we're gonna write code for. Um, hmm, that's a good one. I have, I'm not sure. Um, let's, okay, let's keep it. Let's try keeping it. And so that I can go back and forth. Um, cause like, otherwise I can just leave it there and never look at it. I know. Anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't really bother me, I guess. All right. So I'm going to take that back. Okay. Okay, I'm a little all over the place today, guys. Um, so, but again, I've never done this, so I'm also learning a little bit. Uh, keep the script. Yeah, I think so. It will be easier to relate, right? Um, yeah, um, yeah. I'm gonna keep it for the time being. I mean, I, deleting is always deleting. It's always easy to do, um, but keeping it there, uh, I just hate it. <laughs> I just hate it real. I, grew, I have. I hate to see. I hate. It gives me a headache. Um, uh, but anyway, okay. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to start from scratch again. Um, okay, starting over. Um, uh, okay. <clears throat> Good. Um, so let's get started. Um, as if you remember from the previous video, uh, we implemented the full monument using uh, regular grasshopper components. What we're going to do this time is we're going to implement the exact same logic, but we're going to write it in a purely C sharp using Rhino common and using a grasshopper script. Uh, so in order to do that, um, I'm going to keep this here so that we can go back and forth and see how things uh, in C sharp look 
uh, as opposed to in Grasshopper. Uh, but I'm going to start my own parallel development um, thread, if you will, um, here on the lower bottom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring um, copies of the three components that contain the geometry. Uh, so I'm going to bring those here. Those will be the top surface, the bottom surface, and, um, and the top surface, the bottom surface, uh, and the curve. And I'm going to also copy paste like a bunch of these components, uh, a bunch of these sliders for the size of the um, for the size of the um, of the um, of the of the elements of the monument. Now I'm going to I'm going to start here, and I'm going to drop a C sharp script component, in which I'm going to add um, a bunch of the parameters that I think I will be using throughout. Um, this definition and uh, those will probably only be like a few and then as I keep going I will add more inputs. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to right click here and I'm going to add five inputs. The first one is going to be uh, the boundary curve. The second one is going to be the top surface. The third one is going to be the bottom surface, bottomo the bottom surface, then, um, oh, so I need, no, I need to add more than five, I need to add six. Then I need to add um, um, gap in x direction, I need, or distance, distance in the x direction, I would like to add distance in the y direction, um, I would like to add um, block width and uh, block depth. So the two dimensions of each one of the blocks, okay? Um, I like being sort of descriptive about my variables. If you use B, C, T, S, B, S, D, X, D, Y, it gets a little confusing when you're writing inside. So I recommend, it's a good practice, the inputs of the components to give them like a nice descriptive name that is easier to recognize when you're writing your own code. Um, so, uh, this is going to be the boundary curve, this is going to be the top surface, the bottom surface, distance x, distance y, uh, the width of the block, and the depth of the block, okay? And something that you have to do always as well is whenever you write your inputs, you need to right-click and make sure that the input access, so the whether if we want just an element, whether if we want a list, or whether if we want a tree of elements, is correctly placed. Here, we're gonna be only working with item access, so by default, everything is going to be good. Um, but we also need to keep in mind that we need to specify what type of data are we plugging into that input. So for this one, here is going to be a curve. Uh, for the surface, uh, I'm not going to use a surface, I'm going to use a VREP. Um, and I will get, I will explain why I did that uh, later in this video. So bear with me on this one. I'm going to use here a B rep, and then for distance X and distance Y, I'm going to use doubles because I do want uh, decimal precision. But then for the, wait, this is not block width, this is block count. Uh, yes, sorry. So this is the count, how many elements there are in, in each set, count Y, and then I'm going to add here another couple of uh, of elements and this is going to be block width and this is going to be block depth. All right, that looks much better. Okay, and then so as I was saying for x, for how many elements I want in the x direction, that should be an integer because I don't want decimal part there. Uh, and for block width, I'm going to use doubles and for block depth, I'm also going to use double. So with this, I think we're already, I'm just, I just need to do this guys. I'm sorry, I need a little bit of order. <laughs> um, and I think with this, we're in a pretty good um, point to start going into the component and punching in some code, okay? Um, let's get to it. Okay, um, I found when I was editing the videos last week, I found that doing these long pauses, when I cut through scenes, helps me a lot find later on in the editing software, like where the audio had like a big pause and where it meant that I need to move on 
what, what it meant that I need to like chop there and like cut and paste. Um, so, so yeah. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to open the component and I'm going to start writing code. Um, I see some questions in the in the in the chat. Like, is it best to start learning code with processing C sharp? Let's learn the um, the the Python version. Um, I um, let's let's talk about those things by the end of the by the end of the stream. Um, by the end of the stream, with the Q and A. Okay. Um, open new script and use Alt Tab. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Daniel. Um, Keep the script, open new script and use alt. Ah, okay. So like, oh, you mean like opening one of these and then just like switching between this one and this one. Ah, okay. Uh, that's also a good idea. Um, but well, we're already here, so so yeah. So let's 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 get to it. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's go. Let's start. Um, so I'm going to go into my C sharp script component, I'm going to double click here. And then I'm going to open the C sharp editor. Before I do that, I'm going to I'm going to do something that I like a lot, I'm going to put a panel here on the output, because the output is a really good place to look at where, um, where you have your errors and where something is not making sense for the C-sharp compiler. And that's going to happen a lot through the course of this development. So I want to see, I want to have a good grasp of like the console window that's going to tell me um, everything that I'm doing wrong, basically. I also want to use this to give myself some information here and then. So for example, something that I can do very easily to see if the component is working is that I can open the component and I can just type print. And then, uh, for example, hello, Berlin. Uh, and I and that's it. And then I can run this component. And I can see that the component is outputting this string that I just created. So everything is working well. So I think we are good to start. Now, what is the first thing that we can do? Uh, Okay. Uh, can you guys see me again? All right. Okay. Yeah, that was a, a big crash. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Um, I, I think my internet just like stopped or for some reason. Uh, can you guys see me? Is it good? Okay, working now. All right. Okay, so all right, um, where where did I freeze? I froze. I didn't really, I didn't really get into any of this, right? Okay, all right, good, good. <laughs> okay, so let me get back um, to this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't really know what happened with that. I am actually, I'm actually connected through um, Ethernet, so. To my modem, so I don't know. I don't know what happened there. I'm within the first part of you generating the list, go to the point of opening up and printing hello. Okay, all right. So let me start over again with that. Um, cool. So the first thing we're going to do is um, we're going to just. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to start by generating the grid of points in two dimensions. Um, and in order to do that, before we use the grid component in Grasshopper, but what in th at this point, uh, in C Sharp, we're going to do it manually. So what we're going to do is we're going to start an empty list that to contain all those points. And then we're going to use a double, a nested for loop to go row by row over all the points of that grid and create them based on their coordinates and then add them to that list. Um, so let's start by doing that. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a comment. This is a really good practice. So for example, generate base points. And then here, I'm going to create a, an empty list of point 3D objects that I'm going to call base points. 
and that's going to be a new list, something like this. Um, something interesting that I that I run a lot into is that people uh, often ha often go often think that point three D in Rhino Common refers to a point with three dimensions, uh, but all points in Rhino uh, have three dimensions. The three D part actually refers to the fact that it's three doubles. Uh, that are representing the coordinates of this point, as opposed to uh, a different structure that exists in Rhino Common, which is the point 3F, which is three floats uh, for the coordinates of that point. The difference between doubles and floats is that uh, doubles have much more precision than floats, but they also take up more memory. So if you're working with like millions of points, you may want to do point 3F uh, because it's faster and cheaper. Um, but if you're working with only a handful, 0.3D is perfectly fine. Um, okay, so uh, now what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a double for loop, a nested for loop, um, that I'm going, and I'm going to iterate um, however many times in x direction, however many times I need in for, of blocks in that direction, and in the y direction I'm going to iterate how many, however many blocks I want in that other direction. So I'm going to say uh, int j equals zero, j is less than however many elements, um, how did I call this? Count y, right? Uh, yes, however many elements in the y direction I want, and then j plus plus. Um, again, um, I still haven't recorded the videos that explain what a for loop is and how do you design it, but I will get to that in a, in a, at some point, and you will find links uh, here or here or here somewhere with whenever that happens. Okay. Uh, and now I'm going to create another for loop for i equals zero. i is less than the number of elements that we want in the x direction. Um, and i plus plus. And then at this point, what we need to do is we need to figure out uh, the coordinates of this point. Uh, a good practice is to say, well, I'm going to create a variable called x. This variable is going to represent where this point should be in a space. And this point should be in a space, uh, probably, um, if, if the point is the first one, the second one, the third one, or the fourth one, it should be that many times the distance between the blocks themselves, right? So that means that this is probably uh, distance in the x direction times where we are in counting in that x row. So that would be i. Similarly, for y, um, similarly for y, it's um, distance y times j. And then z is going to be 0, so we don't really need this here. Uh, we can create now a point 3D object called p. This can be a new point 3D uh, with the x coordinate, the y coordinate, and 0, as we just created those two. Um, and then to finish this, I can just add to the list that I had, I can just add this point that I created from scratch. All right. Um, let me run this first. If I run this, I see that there's no errors. So that is great. But I can't really see those points. I can't really see them because I need to output them. Um, uh, I need to output them uh, of the components. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start creating outputs here of things that are meaningful in my uh, in my components. For example, these are going to be, I'm going to call these like uh, B points or uh, ground points or something like that. Okay. And then as I do that, I'm going to go back into my component. And at the very end of the component, I'm going to say ground points is going to be equal to that list of points that I just generated base points. As I do that, I'm going to press run. And you can see that those points show up here. I'm going to close. I'm going to add here like a generic data component so that I can like switch between them. And I can turn this off. And you can see that these points are the grid of points that I just created with these two for loops. And if I want more in one direction, more in the other direction, or if I want to tweak their distances, they are properly linked with, um, with these variables. So that's great. Um, so good. First things first. The next thing we're going to do um, is we're going to, well, I'll talk about that in, in the next in the next um, in the next um, chunk. Okay, so good. We're we're good. 
Um, this will output a flat list with all points, right? How would you write this so that it outputs a list for each row? Um, that is a very good question, Rafael. Uh, instead of using a list, um, you would probably want to use a data tree of elements. Uh, you would probably want to use a data tree. Uh, and with data trees, you can control branches and you can control paths. Um, um, but um, but we we won't really be needing that here in this in this tutorial because if you remember from the previous videos, we actually ended up having to break down that data tree structure uh, because of like how different the data structure became as soon as we started removing points that were outside of the curve, right? So. Um, so we're, I'm going to leave that for some other tutorial uh, and explaining data trees. Um, but yeah. <clears throat> okay, good. Um, what, is, what is the next things we're going to do? Um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to, um, we're going to find the containment and we're going to find it this all we're going to clear out all the points that are outside of this curve. Okay, so so let's do that. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to remove all the points that are outside of their curve um, from that list. So we're going to say clear clear points outside curve. Um, I think call is a better word here. And uh, before we do that, what we will have to figure out is whether if those points are outside of, um, are outside, inside, or where they are. Uh, remember, it didn't say true or false. It gave us numbers 0, 1, 2, depending on the relationship between uh, the curve and the point. 0 for outside, 1 for coincident, and 2 for inside. You will see that in C sharp we are going to use a very similar technique. It's just going to involve like writing these things in a slightly different way. So let me let me get into that. What, what I'm going to do is um, um, I usually don't like modifying lists of data that I've already created um, because sometimes it can get cumbersome and get, it can get confusing. So if we're not working with millions of data, in points with the cold points. So I'm going to create another another list um, called points. That's going to be a new list um, of point 3D objects. Um, and um, you will also see out there a lot of people, instead of declaring the variable as what it is, a list of 3D points, just writing var. This is a very common practice because uh, it just so happens that the compiler when you say here that what you're creating is a new list of point 3D objects, the compiler already knows that this variable should be of the type list point 3D. Okay, um, you will see that a lot out there. Um, I'm going to try not to do that because I think from an educational point of view, it's nice for beginners, for people who are learning to see what things are as opposed to that general bucket of var as a keyword, right? So I'm going to try to stick to that unless someday I'm kind of lazy or brain dead and which at which type at which point I will try to <laughs> to do shortcuts. All right. But now um, the interesting thing is we can we can write a for loop, for example, but instead of iterating manually over each one of them, we can use a for each component because now we don't need really the number of where those points are on the list. So I can write a for each uh, loop where I say for each point 3D object P in the list of base points, then I'm going to check if that point is inside of that curve. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, it turns out that it turns out that uh, here contains. Um, you can see that um, by using curve dot contains it we can uh, where are you here yeah you can see that we can test we can compute the relationship between a point and a closed curve region um, um, so I'm going to use this and I'm going to 
open the overloads and I'm going to go over why are you ah why are you flashing ah I do not like the 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 ah all right so okay so let's just look at this in the Rhino common documentation instead uh, which is probably a much better practice so if you type Rhino common and probably curve contains we're probably going to land somewhere there um, this is a good one okay um, I'm going to go back here to the method and I'm going to see that the method has three overloads. It means that I can call it with either just a point, with a point and a plane, and with a point 2D and a plane, and um, a tolerance value. So if I click here, it tells me like this computes the relationship between a point and a curve. The curve must be closed and return the value or the return value will be unset. I have the point as though I want to test. I have the plane. Uh, to compare and I have the tolerance okay um, do I have the plane and the tolerance uh, I mean everything is in the world x y so maybe I can use this one contains because it computes the relationship between blah 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 if we had a more complicated situation where the curve ah. am I freezing again am I freezing again uh, it looks like I might be freezing again where we had um, a more complicated situation relation between them, um, then we can probably we we will probably need to use this here. So let me let me get to that. So it contains and then the p that I'm going to use uh, and something very important. Um, something very important. I would like to highlight that the return value. So what this method gives me is this thing called point containment which I'm not really sure what it is. I'm just going to, let me just write that here. So point containment PC equals boundary curve, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, I'm going to run this, see if it works. Um, and I'm getting an error here. It's not an error. It's a warning. And it's telling me that Rhino point, the curve contains with just point is obsolete. Um, and it's asking me to use the version that takes a tolerance. That is probably going to be this third one here, the one that has a double. Um, okay, I'll we'll get to that in a second. Let me we'll we'll fix that in a second. Uh, let me let me finish this. Um, let me finish this before with this version, and then we get to to that one. Um, what is point containment? Point containment is this strange thing. So I, the re you can see the return value is of the type of point containment. If I click here, you can see that point containment is an enumeration. And you can think as an enumeration as, as a list of numerical values that have names. It means uh, for one, the relation means that it's inside. For two, the relation means it's outside. And for three, the relation means that it's coincident. Um, this is also very interesting because if you remember from the, if you remember from here, in, in this one, the numbers are different. Here, the numbers are zero is outside, one is coincident, and two is inside. Whereas here, two is not inside, it's outside, and zero is unset or whatever. So um, these kind of things are things that we need to keep in mind when we switch between Vanilla Grasshopper and Rhino Common because um, the authors that developed both frameworks may have had different opinions about certain things and those reflect on how we use and how we have to take a, pay attention to um, um, to how the code is written. So, so what that means is that the points that we are interested in are the ones that have a point containment value of one. Okay. How can we check that? Um, well, first of all, we can do something. Let me just uh, output this here on the on the window and say for each one of these points, uh, just go ahead and print PC dot uh, to string. And if I do that, I'm probably going to get a full list of like points are outside, outside or inside. You see this? This is actually pretty nice. This is what I meant by a list of values that instead of having numbers, they have names of sorts. That's what an enumerator is. Um, but it's also great because what this means is that I don't really need to remember 
which number corresponds to inside or outside, what I can do is I can do something like this. I can say if PC point containment equals equals point containment point containment dot inside, then take that point and add it to the cold points list. Curled points dot add this value here. As I do that and I press run, everything works well. Um, but I can't really see anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the output instead of base points, I'm going to just use the cold points and boom. Uh, now the output is just that list of points that contains only the ones that uh, were checked for containment inside. Okay, good stuff. Okay. Uh, okay. Blah, 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 blah. All right. Um, is this, am I still fluid? Yes. Um, I don't know what's wrong with the internet today. Anyway. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, is it better have it to use lists of arrays or arrays? Uh, that's a very good question, Daniel. Um, it's usually, if you want performance, it's usually better practice to use arrays. Um, however, C Sharp um, is already very, very optimized to work with lists. So unless unless you're working with like really, really big list of like millions of data and points, I think the performance gains are not that great. Um, and, um, and you can go back and forth between them. I think a general rule of thumb is if you're going to be working with, if you need performance and you want to be working with um, data structures that are not going to change a lot, so you're not going to be adding or removing elements, then you want to use arrays. Um, but if you're going to be working with lists, where you do it one. Um, so for this case, when I started with the grid of points, I didn't really know how many points I was going to have inside. Um, so that's why a list made much more sense. Remember when, that when you create an array, as you create it, you have to define what the size of that array is. And that would have been a very difficult thing here. We would have had to do something like go over all the points first, check containment, then count how many were inside, then create the array, and then go over all of them again and like and fit them inside of the array. So it would have required two for loops and that becomes much more expensive than using a list as opposed to an array. Um, so, so yeah, it depends on the situation. Um, I may actually end up using arrays at some point here uh, instead of lists. Will you try with Visual Studio? Um, I haven't found a good way of integrating Visual Studio inside of, to work with C Sharp scripting components. Visual Studio is much better if you're going to be working with, if you're going to create your own Grasshopper plugin. So, um, so for this exercise, I will not be using Visual Studio, no. Um, so is it better to create a list of lists than, and then over the for loop? A list of lists is not exactly the same as a grasshopper data tree. You would not get, as far as I believe, I'm not entirely sure about what I'm saying, but I don't think you would be getting the paths and the branches and that kind of stuff. So um, if you really want something, that replicates the behavior of the point grid, um, where you have this branch of elements, uh, then you want to work with data trees in C Sharp scripting components uh, instead. Uh, it's a really good structure uh, to work with. It's very flexible. Um, uh, hi from Syria. Uh -huh. uh, hi, Mo Mohammed. I'm assuming that's, that means Mohammed. <laughs> hey, Cody. <laughs> good to see you, man. Uh, Alfredo, how you doing? Um, okay, let's keep going. So I'm going to, <clears throat> okay, let's keep going. As you noticed before, the compiler is complaining because the curve contains one single point 3D is a method that uh, the authors of Rhino Common had flagged as obsolete. That means that very soon, they will discontinue that method and that and they're giving you like a warning um, so that uh, you know that it's going to be 
cut off very soon from development and that you would rather be better off migrating to a more modern version of that method. Um, so I think it's a good thing to do. So why, why not? Let's just, let's just do that. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to back, go back to here, look at the documentation and see that what this method contains with tolerance needs is it needs the um, uh, contain, it needs the point, it needs a plane in which the curve lays and it needs a value for tolerance. But do we have that plane? The question is, do we have the plane where the curve is? Right now, we know that that curve is inside of the xy plane. And we know that just because we created the curve that way. Um, but whether if if the curve was a little like um, uh, off the plane, or if whoever created that curve was not did not pay good attention, um, then that would break our definition. So in order to do that, um, maybe what we can do is like we can actually take a look at the curve and check first if it's planar, and then find which plane it's inside, so that we create something that is a bit more resilient to input data that is not correctly formatted. Um, so let's do that right now. And let's do that before we call the points and the curve. Um, uh, and let's write something that says here, I don't know, something like um, make sure curve is good. All right. So something that we can do, for example, is uh, let's start by checking if the curve is planar, right? So I'm going to say if uh, what was the curve? Boundary curve is boundary curve. And then we can see a lot of um, a lot of things that we can access a lot of properties and methods. So I'm going to go here what it says is planar. And then you can see that the overloads are just that or it's asking me for a tolerance. So I'm just going to go for the for the um, for the basic value. And remember that what I want to check here is if the curve is not planar. And if it's not planar, I want the component to stop and give the user a warning like, hey, I can't work with this, I need a planar curve. So I'm going to say if the curve is not planar, so that's why I'm using this exclamation sign here, then I'm going to issue a warning or an error in this component, I'm going to make the component red. And in order to do that, C sharp scripting components, uh, give you access to an instance of the component itself. So there's this word called component that basically represents this C sharp scripting component that we are working in right now. And you can see that there are a lot of things that we can do with this component right now, we can bake geometry, we can figure out what the category is. Um, this, uh, this is much more relevant if you're working natively, and if you're developing a grasshopper plugin. Uh, but for the time being, uh, the method that I want to add here is the add runtime message. If I open this, it tells me it asks me for two things. First, what kind of level of error message I want to send and the actual message. So for example, let's say I want to say here, grasshopper run runtime message level dot and here I can choose between a remark, a warning or an error. So I want an error, I want to stop and say, and say, No, I need a planar curve. And I'm also going to add a return value here so that I make sure that the component stops executing and nothing else goes on. Okay. Uh, so that's going to be the first test. Let me see if this works. I'm going to hit OK. And everything works fine because this curve is planar. But let me let me create a curve that is not planar. Um, where is the object snap? Yeah, I'm going to close this F10. I'm going to drag this point off plane. All right, and I'm going to drag this point off plane as well, too. And now I see that this curve is non planar. Let me bring this curve inside of um, inside of grasshopper. And then as I plug it here, boom, I get the component goes red, I get an error. And then this error gives me the custom error that I just described. No, I need a planar curve. All right. And then and nothing else goes on, you can see that the points were not generated. Um, so this is a good thing because we're checking our inputs for sanity if they fit our requirements. And then we're giving the user good feedback about Oh, we just can't work with this, you have to give me a planar curve. Okay. So these kind of things are usually really good practice to implement. Okay, so let me go back to normal, and I'm going to delete this nasty curve. 
And now, uh, now that we know that the plane is curved, we can probably find, blah, blah, blah. now that we know that the curve is planar, now we can probably find which plane that is and use that plane uh, for the containment. We'll take a bathroom break. <laughs> All right, uh, just one minute or two, okay? I'll be right back. Do, 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 do. I need a, like Daniel Schiffman, I need like some music, like do, 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 do. we're leaving. All right, see you in a couple minutes. Okay, I'm back. <sighs> ah, so many wonderful people here. Okay. Um, Zach, when are you going to take me out for a crab again? Um, I really miss that. <laughs> okay, uh, let's get back to business. Where were we? I don't know where we were. Uh, what were we doing? Okay, yeah. So we needed. What did we need? Um, uh, oh, thank you, Parastorm. <laughs> um, what were we? Where were we? Uh, yes. Now we have the curve. We know it's planar. Now we have to find the the plane, and then um, okay. Okay, let's get going. The next thing we're going to do is now that we know that the curve is planar, now we need to find that plane, okay? That's going to be super easy to do. Um, I'm going to open here uh, and here you will notice that if I say boundary curve dot, there is a method called uh, try get arc circle ellipse plane. Let's try to get a lot of things. Um, you can't see the tooltip is overflowing on my other screen. Uh, but if you see try get plane, you can see that this component tests the curve for planarity and return the plane. Um, we could have used just this to see if the curve is planar, but I think it was a good exercise to do anyway. Um, I want to point out that the return type is a Boolean. So this method tells me whether if it was successful getting the plane or not, but the actual plane, I have to get it through an out a reference through an out reference. So I want to say that I want to do that. Um, and I want to say here, I need for an out, I need to store the result of this computation on a plane object. Something that I can do is I can create, for example, a plane called um, curve plane here. And then here in the out, I can say, uh, store the result of that computation outside here on curve plane. Uh, is that correct? Yes, that's working good. That's working good. And now, now that I'm here, now that I do have the plane, the curve plane, I can substitute this obsolete method and say contains is going to remember is going to take uh, three 
parameters is going to take the point, it's going to take the plane of the curve, and it's going to take the tolerance. So the point is going to be P, the plane is going to be curve plane, and then tolerance is going to be some value that we, some small value, so 0 0.001, for example. As I do this, you see that I don't get the warning message anymore because I'm using the most modern version of that method, um, which, which it's nice, okay? All right, so we're good for the next step. And the next step is going to be, what is the next thing that we did? Um, we, can, we can probably do here is already start removing uh, from the points. We can probably, from this list of points, we can probably start removing the ones that are very far away from, no, that are the ones that are closer to the, to the curve like we did before, right? Uh, so the ones that were closer to the curve, we just remove them uh, randomly. So we can probably do that now here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we're going to do that here. Yes. Um, how are we going to do that? We need to create a random object and we need to compute the distance of each one of these points um, to the curve. We need to look at that distance and we need to invert that distance and then compare that to a random value. And if the value is under that threshold of probability, then we remove that point from the list. Okay, so let me explain that then. <clears throat> huh. The next thing we're going to do is now that we have all the points inside of the curve, we're going to implement the same logic that we did in the previous video where the, we're going to randomly uh, remove some of those blocks, but the probability of those blocks to be removed is going to be larger the closer they are to the curve um, and with a random probability. So what we're going to do is we're going to create another list of points um, and we're going to compare for each one of those points the distance to the curve. We're going to compute that distance and then <clears throat> as we do that, we're going to create a random value and then we're going to figure out if we should remove that point from the list or not. So let's get going with that. Um, I'm going to go here and I'm going to say call points very close to the curve. So what is the first thing that I need to do? Well, for each one of these points, well, first of all, I'm going to create another list of points, point 3D, um, random called points. This is a terrible long name, but whatever. Um, I'm going to create a list of point 3D objects. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over all these called points here. And, um, and um, actually, maybe I could do this inside of here. We could probably mix both things. We could probably mix containment and we can probably mix uh, figuring out if they should be randomly removed. Uh, but I'm just going to keep them separate just for the sake of clarity, okay? Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over all the points here in the cold points list. And then I'm going to compute the distance to the curve. And then I'm going to work with that. So for each point 3DP in um, cold points, First of all, I'm going to compute the distance to the, to the curve. Um, the way to do that is actually by first figuring out what is the closest point to that, um, what is the closest point to, this, to that point on the curve, and then computing the distance between the two points. So I'm going to create a point 3D object, uh, closest point, Oh, my laptop is doing a really weird noise. Um, <laughs> I hope it doesn't blow up. <laughs> um, point to the closest point. Um, and here I'm going to find uh, what is the closest point uh, to that curve. Um, so what is that going to be? Um, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to look first at the curve because I don't remember how this was. Uh, boundary, boundary curve dot uh, closest point. Yeah. 
uh, finds the param Ah, okay, 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 so good. So what I need here is, if you look at the documentation, it tells me that it needs uh, a test point, but what it gives me is the parameter along that curve where the closest point is. The parameter, you can think of it as the relative distance, sort of, within the curve. It's basically a number that tells me along that curve where that point is situated, okay? Uh, that is one overload. The other one has an additional value, which is maximum distance. If I want to not, if it's too far away, then I just don't check. Uh, and you can see that the parameter is given to me as an out reference. So I'm going to need to first here create double, what is the parameter t? And then here, this is going to be the reference point, And I want the parameter to be output here to this double. So now after this, t will have the value of the parameter at which point that point on the curve is. As I do that, um, as I do that, now I know how far along the curve that point is. What I need to do now is I need to actually get that point. So point, point 3D, uh, point on curve, that's going to be boundary curve, uh, point at, yes. You see, this evaluates a point and it gives me a point at a center and parameter. So it's going to be point at T, and this point here is going to be the point along the line, along the curve that is going to uh, be the one that is closest. I'm just going to, so that for the sake of visualization, this is not what we need to do, but I'm just going to say random call points. Please add this point that I just created here. And I'm going to output that out of this component. And you can see that, boom, I got an error. What is it? Oh, it's a typo. Um, so here, point 3D, you can see, yes, remember here, remember when we did um, closest point here, we also did get like a similar thing. So these are all the points on top of that curve that are the closest to all the points inside of the grid. Now for each one of these points, this is not what I want. Uh, so for each one of these points that are on the curve, now I can compute the distance. Double distance is going to be the distance between the point that I'm checking, P, and the distance to the other point that I am comparing. So distance to PTC, that's the point on the curve. Um, if I do that, um, maybe I can, just for the sake of visual output, I can print this to the console. Uh, oh, sorry, distance. This, uh, I'm going to print distance here to the console. You can see that I have a list of all the values of the distance between the grid points and their closest points on the curve. All right, so it looks like things are going well so far. Um, and now the next thing that I need to do is I need to, um, I need to make sure that the, the points that have a smaller distance to the curve have a higher probability of, um, of, of being called. So I, the way we did that in the previous video is by calculating the inverse distance. So I'm going to do inverse distance is going to be 1.0 divided by distance. Um, and if I print that now, you can see that, um, well, I'm going to print both things. This, I'm going to print this plus a white space, and I'm going to print invert distance. And as I do that, you guys can see that I get both uh, the original value and the inverse. So you can see that when it's the value is small, the val the distance is small, the value is higher. And when the value is higher, the distance, when the distance is higher, the value is smaller. Okay. Now the final thing that we need to do is we need to compare this inverted distance with a random number. And if this value is under that random number, then um, we can, we can remove that from the list. So how can we do that? Um, in the way we do randomness in, in C sharp is with the random object. Um, so we can create a random object, RND. And then this random object, you can think of it as a, 
Think of it as a random number generator. So from this object, we can always ask for random values over and over again. So for example, um, if I say here, double R is going to be R and D, can you please give me, and you see that it has next, it has next bytes and it has next double. The, next, the random component is actually very simple. It, it, it gives me here, when I say next, it tells me that it can give me a random number between, a random number, which is a random integer, which is either zero or one, a random integer between a minimum value and a maximum value, and a random number with a, but that's only for integers. For doubles, for precision, I want something, I want to use next double. What's interesting about next double is that it will always give me a random value between zero and one. And remember that if we're talking about probability, then maybe we want to maximize that. So I want to say, I want to multiply this by 100 so that the random value has a range between zero and 100. Okay. Um, and I'm going to add this here to the output. Um, random value is going to be equal to, this is going to have nothing to do with this, but I just want to show you how we have generated random values from zero to 100 by using the random, the random object. Okay. Good. Um, I'm going to take a, a pause here. Uh, what is the next thing that we need to do? Um, what is it going to be? It's going to be, uh, it's going to be, it's, we're probably going to need inputs here. I want to input a seed to the random number generator. And I want to also input something that controls this value. Um, because a 100 is going to be huge. It's, these values are never going to be under that threshold. Um, so let me, let me talk about that. If you remember from previous from the previous video, um, what we found was that having a value of 100 uh, for the probability was a really large number because since we are inverting values, it's very unlikely that any of these values is actually going to be greater than greater than 100 or is going to be in that range. So this is not going to be a really good range domain for us to work. Uh, I'm going to implement that anyway, and then we're going to go back and then we're going to work with this number and making an input so that we can control the amount of that um, variation. Um, so the rule would be, okay, if inverted distance, which is this value that we have changed here that we have inverted, if this is greater than the random value that we just generated, then what I do want is to the random call points, I want to, I want to add the point that we are checking right now, which means that the point that we were checking for proximity passed the test, it was very far away, and therefore it was not randomly eliminated. So I want to keep it in my list. Um, as I do that, um, I can show you, I can show you how random call points is going to basically, oh, there was an error. What just happened here? Uh, random if, oh no, sorry. If this is under the threshold, sorry, then we are good. Okay, so you can basically see how all points are inside of that threshold, because if I flip it, uh, basically no point is inside of that threshold. So the problem is that the value of 100 numerically is too large for the computation that we're doing. So we may want to add here some kind of probability um, for to slow that down. I'm going to call this maximum probability. Probability. And it's going to be of the type, uh, I'm going to make it type double, all right? Uh, I'm going to write here something that goes from zero to 100, and I'm going to go all the way down to the value of two. Um, for example, and I'm going to plug that in here. This is going to be maximum probability. And you can see that as I do that, some of these values start popping out. So uh, if I go high, 
then they basically disappear right away. But as I go down in this maximum probability, you can see that there's a higher chance that they disappear. And look at how nice is this. At 0 0.16, you can see that almost all the points that were very close to the boundary disappeared. And many of the ones that are inside also did disappear. Let me change the range of this to five, for example, so that we have a bit more precision. Um, and you can see how at this is very nice. This look, this showcases that the algorithm actually works. At 0 0.03, only the ones that are very far at the center are surviving. And as we keep growing, you see how uh, they are getting better, better, better until we get something, uh, for example, like like two. No, I kind of like uh, I kind of like this value uh, here. I, I'm gonna keep it here. I like I like one. Let's say one. Boom. Okay. And another thing that I want to add is I want to add a random seed. Uh, what does that mean? I want to add a value so that that I feed into, sorry, I want to add a value that I feed into the random number generator so that, that I know that for some integer value, I know if I that for the same seed value, I will always be getting the same random number output. Um, so what I want here is in random, I want to add random seed. And therefore, I will know that whenever I change this, the combination of um, the combination of the of the random values is going to be different. But whenever I choose 100, I'm always going to get the same result. So you can see that if I change to zero, but I go back to 100, you can see that I did get the same gaps. Um, so it's a number in a way the random seed is a way of making sure that you always stick to the same pattern of randomness in a way. All right. Okay, um, great. What is the next thing we're going to do? Uh, okay, well, now it's the, it, this was kind of, this was a, this was a little bit, um, if you're not used to randomness, dealing with these things is a little, can be a little uh, overwhelming. Um, it just takes some time. Um, but now the next thing is going to be super simple. We're just going to project um, the points to the surface below. Uh, we're going to project them to the to the surface on top. Uh, we're going to compute the distance, uh, and then on and then for the points in the bottom, we're going to generate the planes, and we're going to give them the random tilt, and we're going to create the boxes, and we're almost we're almost good to go. Um, good. So, um, uh, what are we doing now? Uh, okay. So. We're going to project the points. Let me get to that. Okay. <clears throat> the next thing we're going to do, we are going to take all these points that are now clean and uh, inside of the boundary and like randomly, randomly cleaned up. And we're going to project them to the surface on the bottom that we want to be the ground plane. Um, how are we going to do that? Um, I'm going to clean up some of the code here. And um, I believe that we can do something where we take all those points and, um, and we project them. Um, let me look in Rhino Common. Uh, project points intersection project points to B reps. I like this one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we have project points to B reps, it gives me an array of point 3 ds uh, as opposed to an array list. Um, it's a static method and it needs a list of B reps, a list of points and direction and tolerance, which I think we all have this. This is the main reason why when before when we chose what kind of input type we our C sharp component was going to have instead of choosing surfaces, I chose B reps because B reps in in Rhino Common are 
to my taste, uh, it's, it's a structure, it's a class that is used way more widely across all methods than surfaces. And I believe that B reps actually do contain lists of surface surfaces inside of them and they're trimming information. Um, so it's just, I just happen to end up working with B reps most of the time rather than working with, um, uh, with, with surfaces. So this was a good, a good example of that. Um, so this is project point to B reps. So, um, so I'm going to say, well, I want to create a, I want to point to the objects. So points on the bottom, and this is going to be equal to, uh, what was it called? Project points to B rep. Um, and then as I open here, I can see that this is not really recognized. Um, uh, in Rhino geometry, and this belongs to Rhino geometry intersect. So I may have to add the full signature of this method um, to be recognized by, by Grasshopper. So let me do that. Um, so I'm, instead of this, I'm going to write Rhino geometry intersect intersect dot project. Where are, where are you? Pro ah, come over here, project. Project points to be rep. Um, I don't know why it's not working. Maybe IntelliSense is not working. But let's um, let's just do it. So I'm gonna take bottom surface. Um, I'm going to take the list of points. It's going to be. So what are the? Yes. So a list of B reps. I don't have a list of B reps. I only have one. But I'll take. I'll get to that in a second. A list. The list of points that I want to project. Um, so that's going to be the random call points. Uh, I'm going to add them here so that it's easier to read. Then the next thing is going to be the direction for the projection that is going to be pointing down. So that's going to be vector 3D dot, for example, C axis. And I'm going to invert this so that it's pointing downwards. And then the other value for tolerance is going to be something like, I don't know, uh, 0 0.001, for instance. I'm going to run this. And as I run this, I'm probably going to get an error. Yes. Uh, Rhino geometry intersect. Are you missing an assembly reference? Why project points to B reps? Why is this not working? Do I need to import this? Uh, using. Uh, do I need that? Uh, Oh, no, sorry, because there is another signature. There is inter there's Rhino geometry intersect intersection and then points. Uh, okay, my bad. Okay, so here, that's why it wasn't popping up. Okay, so intersect dot intersection dot project points. To, there you go. Now it can see it. Okay. All right. So now we're good. Project points to be rep. Now we have the full and we do that. And as I, as I thought, yes, uh, this C sharp is getting confused between the, um, this, this needs to be a list of, um, of B reps as opposed to one single B rep. Um, we could create it here, uh, project points to bottom surface. We could create it here, but I'm just, because I'm just going to use it once. I'm just going to create it on the fly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say new list of B rep objects. I'm uh, new list of B rep objects. And then right away, I'm going to use curly brackets to feed it with one single element bottom surface. And this way, I'm just creating on the fly a new list of B reps with this one element already in that in that list. As I do that, this is probably going to work. Um, what is the output? I can't really see this yet, but I can see that if I change this and I put it here, the points in the bottom, now I can see that I have all those points projected on the bottom of my surface. That's pretty good. Can we do the same for the ones on top? Um, yep, so let's do that. Um, I'm just gonna copy. Be careful with copy pasting. Copy pasting is the devil. 
it will always give you problems and you will never and it was, they're really hard to debug okay so try to avoid copy pasting because you always forget that you needed to change something something uh, and uh, it's going to be terrible so points on top uh, this is going to be top surface uh, random call points this should be a positive z-axis um, so that's good and I'm going to substitute this to see if it works here and yes I do have all the points on the surface now on the top surface so I have points in the bottom and points in the top um, good so probably yeah so we're probably ready to move on to working with the planes on the bottom okay Oh yeah, Scott. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't see it. Yeah, but it was intersect intersection. Thank you. Um, yep. Sometimes Rhino Common is a little confusing, but yeah, it's it's also very powerful. So um, whatever. Um, what is the next? Um, yeah, we're gonna create the planes, and then remember we're gonna do the tilting. Okay. <clears throat> so let's get to that. We're almost there, guys. Are you liking this? Is this interesting? Is this too much coding? Um, I like coding a lot, um, but I don't know. I don't know how you guys feel about this. <laughs> uh, okay. <clears throat> um, let me get some water. Good. <clears throat> um. Great, uh, so we're almost there. Let's get to the planes in the bottom. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create, a, we're going to add a comment because it's a really good practice. Planes on the bottom, all right? And I'm going to create a, here, you see, that's a really good, interesting question now. Here, I could create a list of planes or I could create already an array of planes because I know how many planes I'm gonna have. I'm gonna have as many planes as points bottom and points top. Um, I would typically use a, a list because I'm a little lazy with typing, but for the sake of, uh, for the educational purpose of it, I'm going, to, I'm going to choose to create an array instead so that you guys can see how, um, how that can be done. So in this case, I'm going to say, I'm gonna create an array of plane objects called um, base planes, for example base planes and this array is going to have us it's going to be a new array of play objects and remember that here I need to add um, I need to specify the size of this array the size of this array is going to be equal to the size of points in the bottom so that's going to be length here okay um, and um, and now that I have that uh, what I probably want to do is I probably want to start with um, with a plane that is um, that is in the that is parallel to world x y. So, for example, I'm going to create a for loop where I'm going to go is less than base planes dot length i plus plus, and here I'm going to say plane pl is going to be equal to plane world x y, and um, and base planes dot i is going to be equal to pl okay um and um i probably want to keep the points there so i'm going to create a new output uh which is going to be uh planes for example um and i'm going to switch that here uh and um here where it says planes i'm going to output base planes as i do that um nothing happens <laughs> i'm not sure why uh, base planes what is going on why am i not oh yeah they are here so why are they not showing up oh okay because they're all in the center because I did not use, because I did not use the bottom points as centers for those planes. That was lame. <laughs> okay, so pl.origin is going to be equal to, uh, for example, 
points in the bottom dot uh, i and uh, yep and here they are now i have horizontal planes on top of each one of those points on the bottom of the surface okay um so we're good okay and now i need to <laughs> yeah yeah galiaf yeah it's a really large it's a really large cup yes um but i like it a lot look at look look at the size size of my head <laughs> this is america man everything is really large here you know <laughs> okay um okay um yeah so now tilting the planes <clears throat> One of the last things that we need to do now is we need to take, like we did in the previous video, we need to take all these planes that are all aligned and on the same uh, and they're all hor perfectly horizontal. And what we want to do is we want to tilt them a little bit to give uh, these boxes that we're going to create on top of them, we want to give them like a little bit of a slant, okay? Uh, in order to do that, remember from the last video, what we're going to do is we're going to take the X vector of those planes, we're going to rotate it randomly, 360 degrees, and we're going to use that vector as the rotating axis for those planes, which will be rotated also a random value between zero and some some maximum angle. So let's 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 do that. Um, before before I decide to store this plane in the base planes, I'm going to start messing with it a little bit. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to take the x. I'm going to fetch the x axis uh, so that's going to be it's going to be from pl is going to be uh, what is it um, x axis okay the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to rotate that um, vector uh, around i'm going to rotate it a random value between zero and 360 degrees um, and then um, and then yes so let's do that um, uh, I'm going to create a random angle and this is going to be, I'm going to use the random object that I had before, RND, and I'm going to ask for, from here, I'm going to ask for a random double number. But remember that I want the next double is always going to give me values from 0 to 1, so I need to amplify that to go from the range of 0 to 360, which is just as easy as multiplying this by 360. Okay, and then what I can do after that is I can say I'm going to take the vector and I'm going to rotate it um, around um, <clears throat> around a a, uh, a rotation axis. So one thing that I want to note here is that if you as you can see from the um, from the autocomplete and from the help text, the angle has to be in radians. So I cannot use the random angle in 360 that I used before. So I will have to change that to radians. And also the rotation axis that you can see there um, is going to be uh, the C axis because I want, since the planes are horizontal, I want to rotate around the C axis. So let's fix that. I'm going to go here and I'm going to say, I want the random number to go to be a value between zero and, uh, sorry, and then value of pi. However, um, if you remember from my other videos, I'm a really firm believer in Taoism, uh, <laughs> which is a mathematical belief that it, it means that we should all probably just start working with 360 degrees being two pi radians, which is kind of convoluted to say. So I'm just going to treat myself to a nice uh, constant here called tau, which is going to be two times math pi. And then here, I'm just going to say tau times next double. Um, this is not a joke. If you Google tau day uh, or the tau manifesto, you will be able to read a lot about this. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm going to rotate this vector around the random angle here. And then the axis is going to be the C axis. So here I'm going to go for the C axis. Uh, so now I have uh, a random 
vector that I've rotated 360 degrees, and I want to use that vector to rotate the plane. So um, what I can do is I can probably say PL rotate, um, and I do have a lot of options now. I have sine angle, cosine angle, and an axis. I have an angle and a vector. I have an angle, a vector, and a center of rotation, and blah, blah. So this is probably the one that I want to choose. Um, so I want to choose around, I want to rotate a custom angle around a custom axis and a center, the center being the center of the actual plane. Uh, for this, I need to generate first, I need to generate a random angle. Um, and remember that that is something that we wanted to control from the outside. We wanted the, to give the user the possibility of choosing the maximum angle for uh, the tilting. Okay, so I'm going to add that to the inputs of this component here. Um, so here I'm going to add a new parameter called maximum tilt, and this is going to be of the type double. Um, and here, for example, uh, I'm just going to copy paste this and right here maximum tilt. I'm going to start with a value of five, for example, but um, we can we can we can check later if it's good or not. Um, and then so here, where was I? I was rotating the plane, but first I need to find a random angle. So double random tilt angle. That's going to be also random next double, which remember from zero to one. Now I'm going to amplify it from for the value that I just got. So maximum tilt times the value of zero to one. And now that I have that, I can rotate the plane. Uh, what am I going to rotate? I'm going to rotate it around an, uh, an angle. Um, so that's going to be uh, random tilt angle. And then the axis is going to be the vector that I just rotated, the x. And the center of rotation is going to be the center of the plane. So PL dot origin. Okay, one thing to note here. Um, this, comp this rotation takes the angle in radians, but here in max tilt, you see that I, this would have been like something from zero to 90, for example, this I am taking it as, as, as probably as degrees, right? So what I need to do, I need to convert the maximum tilt value to degrees, sorry, to radians before I compute this maximum tilt angle. Um, that is very easy to do by saying, take this value, multiply it by uh, tau and divide it by 360, okay? But since those two, tau divided by 360, are always going to be the same, um, we can save ourselves a tiny bit of calculations by just saying, let me say, let me create a, a, a variable that is going to be called two degrees. And this is going to be the value of tau divided by 360. And now I can just replace this here. Uh, and I have saved myself a one multiplication for each iteration of the for loop. It's not great, but it's much easier to read. Um, so I think we're good here. Uh, and as I do this, are the planes going to rotate already? Are they rotating? Uh, so let me see. What, what if I crank this up up to 90? Uh, am I getting those rotations? Yes, I am getting them. Okay, so it's just that... Um, with the value of five, it's just very subtle, subtle. Okay, so those planes have also already have the tilt, so we're almost ready. Uh, are you guys not excited? Uh, so we're almost ready to go. Cool. And the last thing we're going to do is we're just going to, um, we're just going to create boxes, uh, put them there, and then output them at the component. That's going to be the easiest part of everything that we have done so far. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's get to that and then we can move on to Q&A because uh, it's been already two hours. Uh, I don't know how you guys deal with me for so long. <laughs> okay, my laptop is doing a really strange noise. Um, I burned my other laptop yesterday, uh, so <laughs> I don't want that to happen to this one because otherwise live stream is over and my life without a laptop in quarantine oh <laughs> i cannot i cannot imagine what that looks like 
All right, cool. Let's get to it. And finally, the last thing we're going to do is now that we have the planes in the right position on the bottom and with a nice tilt, then we're just going to place boxes on top of it, which is going to be by far the easiest thing we're going to do in this tutorial. So let's get to it. Um, I'm going to create a new output. So that's going to be, for example, the blocks, so which is what we actually want to do here. Um, and all the way at the end here, I'm going to create, create concrete blocks. Um, now, um, should I create a list or an array? It doesn't really matter. I could you choose one or the other. Um, I'm just going to use a list in this at this point because I just <clears throat> I'm, I'm a little it's it's kind of late and I'm a little lazy. So I'm going to create a list of boxes um, that I'm going to call boxes new list uh, blah 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 um, and um, and now I'm going to iterate over each one of the planes in that I have designed before. So for each for each plane PL in base plane. Now I'm going to use that plane to create a box. Um, how did I create boxes? Um, I guess with the box constructor. Uh, let's see if that works. Box box B equals new box. Um, yep. And what can I do? I can create a box from a bounding box from a base plane and three intervals. I like that uh, from points from base geometry and from what nah. So I'm going to stick to this one. Um, I like this one a lot. So I'm going to use new lines to make things clearer. So I want to create a plane, I'm, I'm going to create a box from the base plane and three numerical ranges. So the base plane is going to be PL, the interval, the x size is going to be a new interval, which is going to go in the x direction is going to go from uh, we we'll, we had the dimensions of the boxes as inputs. So we have um, What did we have we had uh, block width and block depth? So that it is interval is going to be we going to go from minus block width to positive Sorry from minus half the block width to positive half the block width. So that's going to be minus 0 0.5 times um, block width and to 0 0.5 times block width. Um, the y is going to be very similar, but it's going to be block depth instead. And what is the C height of these blocks? Um, the C height is the distance between the planes in the bottom and the planes on the top, um, which I kind of forgot to compute. <laughs> Okay, so um, I guess I'm just going to give it like a like what like a value right now so that we can finish this. Uh, but we'll have to get back to this. So boxes dot add uh, the box and then here what it says blocks is going to be equal to boxes. Um, uh, there's some kind of error here. Um, so let's see what's wrong. You cannot convert from int to rhino uh, to from interval. Yes. So because I have to create a new interval from zero to one, for example, um, and I'm starting at zero because I want my boxes to be sitting on the plane uh, and start from there. Um, so I'm going to do that. And you can see that I have like all these boxes that are like one unit high and they do. You can see that it, the, the tilting is much noticeable right now. Right. Um, let me. Oh, no, wait, 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 wait. So the block width. Yeah, the whole actually. Uh, <laughs> I actually like that a lot for some reason. Anyway, um, so we need to calculate the distance between the two planes. Um, so <clears throat> we could do that in two different ways. We can create a an array of doubles that represent those distances. Or we can just do it here in line. Um, I think we're going to do this here in line. Uh, but because I've been working with the points in the bottom and the points at the top as a race, I think I'm going to have to switch to a race here. Uh, because it's because I'm going to need the iterator, the value of which 
which plane are we talking about to compare them together. So I'm going to I'm going to switch this to arrays and it's going to be a new uh, box array of how many points? Well, as many as we have uh, base planes um, length. And here um, I'm going to I'm going to create a for loop um, where uh, I'm going to iterate over all the base planes. And because I do have the exact same number of base planes, bottom points and top points, uh, the for loops are going to match. So that's why I can I can do this. Uh, I can say double distance is going to be equal to um, uh, where are these uh, points in the bottom element number i dot distance to uh, points in the top element number i. So with this, I can calculate each one of those values. Um, then I can create the box here. Um, and then here I'm going to replace zero with that distance. And then I can now say, uh, well, this plane, I don't really have this plane. So this is going to be, I'm going to have to replace it with the base planes element number I. And then here, I'm just going to have to say boxes element number I is going to be equal to this box that I just created. And as I do that, Ta-da! <laughs> We're done. <laughs> All right, let me tweak a couple of things here. The maximum tilt is going to be two, so that we can see that there is still like a little bit of um, uh, of uh, of tilting, but it's very subtle, which I kind of like. I'm going to use again the display component. Um, where was this? Uh, I'm going to use this to render the boxes, but instead of leaving them pink this time, I'm gonna um, I'm going to I'm going to create them. I'm going to make them gray. I think. Um, yes. So can we do gray here? Yes. And then can we do a uh, uh, shaded? Is that the one that is nice? No, it's uh, Arctic. Is the one that it's. Uh, uh, okay, this one. Yes. Oh, and this one. I need to remove this one. Ah, okay. Uh, and these things here, and I can remove this curve. I can remove this curve. Oh, I don't know what I did. Oh yeah, I can't really remove. I, I have to hide it. Sorry. Hide the curve, and then here, the base. Not the top plane. Not the base plane. Yes, I could fit this here as well, um, and just have it as part up. There you go. Um, so there we have it. Um, our monument, I mean, obviously the scale and the proportions are not great as compared to the real thing, but the spirit is right there, which I kind of like. All right. Um, so that was it. Um, I think this was part three of, uh, making, um, create, replicating this monument with, uh, a pure C sharp logic in one single large component. Uh, the question is out there. I don't really like writing very large components. I think an interesting thing could have been perhaps to like break down the whole process in several components, several C sharp components that communicate with each other with their inputs and outputs. Um, but for the sake of testing, I think this is this has been. Um, but that's like another conversation that we could have in the future. So that was it. I will post this code somewhere. There will be a link somewhere in this video description to where you can download this and maybe like clean it up and make it look a bit nicer. Um, I will leave that exercise up to you. Uh, thank you very much for watching this tutorial and I'll see you somewhere in some other one. Okay. Very good. Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, oh, I forgot, I need to record the introduction. Um, okay, which I totally forgot. <clears throat> so yes. Okay, so let me do that. Real quick. <clears throat> Hi. 
and welcome to part three of the tutorial where we're going to model the Berlin Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, in this third part of the series, what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow the same logic that I followed in the past two tutorials where we modeled the whole monument with a simple, regular, vanilla grasshopper logic. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow all that logic and I'm going to translate it to uh, code that is written in C-sharp using the Rhino common library. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a one, we're going to create one large C-sharp component that incorporates all the logics and all the parameters of the model. And then inside of this component, we're going to write the same grasshopper logic that we did before, but with plain, simple C-sharp code. Um, this has a lot of advantages. It's usually better in terms of performance um, and depending on who you talk to, it, it gives you some more flexibility for certain operations. Uh, but it's definitely a good learning exercise if you're into computational geometry um, and you want to improve your skills when it comes to generating computational uh, geometry uh, again. So stay tuned um, and let's take a look at how we can do that, um, how we can re uh, recreate this monument with, with a C-sharp scripting component. All right, and we're done. <laughs> oh, I'm very tired. Uh, let me save this. I'm going to save this here. I'm going to, I, this I have already saved. I haven't changed really anything. Okay, um, so how was that, guys? Um, um, I think it's probably a good time to drink some water and open it up to Q&A um, or to your comments suggestions um, and uh, I also want to hear about what would you like to see next uh, next week um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys a minute because of the lag between us uh, uh, okay uh, I see a lot of love. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, Kartik, new this method for creating lists is different from how you created lists previously. Can you explain this? Yes. So, um, Kartik is asking um, what I did here when I created the B rep, the list of B reps. Um, the only thing that I did here is that in one line, just because I was only going to use a list of B reps here on this input, instead of creating it and saving it in memory, what I did was I just created it in one line. But this is equal to me having done the following. I could have done list B rep um, uh, bottom surfaces, uh, new list of B rep up. Ugh list of B rep objects and then to this to this list I could have added I could have added bottom surface and then here I could have just saying I could have just instead of creating it on the fly I could have just used that one. It's the exact same thing. Um, I guess what I did here was just creating a shortcut and writing the whole thing in just single one single line because since I knew that I was only going to use this list of surfaces with one surface, I was going to use it only once. I didn't really want to create a variable, add the surface on top of it and keep that in memory. You know, I thought that this approach is a bit cleaner, especially since um, especially since again, since this list will, was only going to be used once. Uh, Reynaldo is reminding me of the intro. Thank you. 99% of the work is management. 1% is creation. <laughs> yes, it is, Scott. <laughs> um, people are thanking. Um, managing, so Rafael is saying managing grasshopper data trees in C Sharp will be interested in a mixed media stream. What do you mean by a mixed media stream? What do you, what do you, what do you, what do you mean by that? Um, also, what are the differences between C Sharp and Python in Grasshopper? And Python script editor, are you planning on making Dynamo series? Um, the, the Python, the difference between the C Sharp scripting and Python scripting is that 
Grasshopper is natively written in C sharp, or at least um, in, I, I think it's actually in Visual Basic that it's written. Um, but both of them compile to this common framework called the net, .NET framework that then compiles to something called the common runtime language. This is basically to say that those two languages have a very direct connection to the core of how Grasshopper is written and, um, and, and where it lives in a, a Windows machine. Uh, when you use the Python scripting component, um, you can use wrappers and you can use code that has been designed to mimic the Rhino common library, but it actually does have to compile at some point back to either C Sharp or Visual Basic. So you're kind of adding an extra layer to the compilation time um, only for the sake of having something that feels and uses the Python syntax. Uh, to create. So for people who, you, who, are, who use Python and are very familiar with Python, um, this is usually an advantage because they're more fluid when writing, but um, I'm, I find myself very fluid in C-sharp as well. So I like that direct connection. Um, that was Said, Said Kozak. That was who was asking. Um, Zach is asking, would it be cool to see how to work with two-dimensional lists in C-sharp? Oh man, yeah, maybe that's 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 a cool thing to do. Uh, whenever we run into that problem, we can probably take a look at that. Um, Rafael is asking how much faster this C shot Voltron is in comparison to your previous destination. It is faster. Uh, I don't know how much faster, but this component, when you click run, it compiles into a component that is has all the code running, and it doesn't have to do all the translations and all the marshalling between data components and so, so it has like way, way less overhead than um, a regular grasshopper definition. So if you want to write things that are very complex and do very strong operations with lots of geometry, then definitely, definitely C sharp gives you a huge advantage. Uh, if you if you were to instead of using a C sharp script component, if you were to write this as a native Grasshopper components, so in Visual Studio, etc., etc., you would even get much better performance than that. Uh, Danielle is voting for data trees. Uh, maybe that can happen at some point. Uh, will you show advanced data tree in C Sharp and Grasshopper? Yes. Another question. Ah, and Rafael, would I rather be called Jose Luis, Jose Luis, or something else? Um, <laughs> I know I have a really long name. Um, my family and my friends, they call me Jose Luis, both. Uh, the first name and the middle name, because in Spain, in Spain, I think that's something that we usually do, because we very often combine middle names with first names. Uh, and Jose is like a very common name. So I like going by Jose Luis, but you can call me Jose. That's perfectly fine too. Um, Pablo is asking whether if it's better to start learning coding processing or C Sharp. Um, I think both are really great. Um, I think that depends on what you're going to be doing. I think processing is really good for learning. I learned how to code myself. Uh, I started, the first thing that I started coding was in processing. Uh, and processing is great if you're going to be doing um, graphics oriented output. So basically things that are, um, that live in, in mostly in 2D. Gra processing is not great for three dimensional geometry processing, like the kind of things that we do here. But it's much, much better than Grasshopper for things such as like uh, working with images, processing video, streaming from a webcam, uh, doing like image recognition, all those things are like so much better in processing, right? Um, so, and C Sharp, native C Sharp, doesn't have any geometry processing capacity, capacities. Everything that we've done today is because we have been using Rhino Common, which is a library that lives in Grasshopper and Rhino, and it's based on C Sharp. So that's very good for geometry processing. Um, but I guess it depends on what you want to do. If you're going to be doing digital fabrication, then C Sharp and Grasshopper or Dynamo is a really good one to go. Uh, if you're going to be doing like PDFs or interactive installations and blah, 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 then processing is a much better uh, platform to learn from. Um, somebody asked before up in the chat if I was going to be doing Dynamo tutorials at some point. I may. I used to work. I used to work at Autodesk at the generative design team. Uh, so my colleagues in the in my group were the ones who developed Dynamo, and I have a lot of libraries and plugins, and I have done a lot of work in Dynamo as well. 
Um, so I don't see why I don't see why not. That could be very interesting. Are you guys Dynamo people? Do you like Dynamo? Are you Dynamo users? Uh, um, Fold Arc is asking for the next stream to do other uh, architectural masterpieces. I do agree. Uh, we could start a series uh, where we do some of this. Um, I don't know if I want to keep. I don't want to do. I don't know if I want to keep doing just that. I may want to uh, switch between this and like more regular tutorials, like let's learn about vectors uh, or surfaces or something like that, and and start building up like a tutorials playlist. Um, so so yeah, I have to I have to think about that. Uh, <clears throat> can we use exterior code editor for Grasshopper C Sharp? I have not seen a good integration of that Kartik, but if you find something, I'd be happy to I'd be happy to listen. Also, moving forward, um, if you guys are really interested in this and you have some time that you could contribute, I could really use some help. Um, all as you can see, all these definitions are super messy, and like I don't really take uh, time to like group things and make things look clean. So I could use some help with somebody. Just taking the definitions that we do here, cleaning them up, adding comments, adding suggestions and help for beginners. And then that's the final version that we post somewhere online. I have not had the time to do that. Also, if somebody is a good um, video editor, um, I, I would also appreciate a lot of help with editing these videos. It's very easy to chop them and just teach them together uh, where I make the pauses, I found out. So if any of you uh, have some time and want to contribute to the to the channel, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, my email is very easy to find online. So, um, um, so I would appreciate some help. Thank you. Um, Jusuf is asking about comparing comparing between Rhino and other C C plus uh, plus SDKs. Um, the thing with Rhino is that Rhino Common is great for geometry processing, like the things that we have done right now. Uh, for C and for C++, um, I haven't really found a framework that uh, is gives me that uh, geometry power. Um, the only closest one perhaps that I can think of is Open Frameworks that is really, really, really good also for interactive media, video projections, etc. And it has a very powerful um, connection with, with OpenGL and three-dimensional graphics, 3D graphics. Uh, it's just that for some reason C, -sharp, C++ is not so, I think it's not so nice to learn. It has like a lot of overhead with like memory pointers and references and things that are very low level. So it has perhaps like a steeper entry barrier, but maybe that's something that we could that we could look at at some point. Um, and it is true that um, and it is true that somebody's pointing that uh, the nervous systems group uh, uses a lot of C++ and they also use for generating their meshes and their form because C++ is actually among the most powerful languages these days. It has a very, very high performance because it's very, it's very, very close to your CPU. It needs very few translations to do whatever it needs to do at the level of your CPU and your computer. So C++, if you need performance, is definitely one of the best environments that you can uh, you can work with. Saeed is asking if I have crazy projects in processing. I have crazy projects in everything. <laughs> so, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Excited for a Grasshopper Plus Runway ML stream. Ah, okay, so I do actually have a couple tutorials out there. Oh, okay. Good question. Um, so I'm working on. Let me let me show you guys something. Oh, thank you for that. I'm working. So I do have a library that I haven't published yet. Uh, that I call. I think the name I have right now is Dynamic Data Tools. Um, that is a terrible name, um, but this library is basically a library where where I'm writing components that. Um, that help you manage data that is changing very rapidly and constantly in Grasshopper. Uh, because I, I do a lot of communication between different processes and different machines and a lot of network communication. I, also, I often find myself having a Grasshopper component that is updating constantly and that is like streaming the same value over and over again. Uh, and that was very painful. So I am, I had a library of tools 
to work with dynamic data that was private, it was just mine, but I'm planning on releasing it open source or publishing somewhere very soon. I just need a good name, guys. <laughs> Can you help me find a good name for something that is dynamic data tools? Like, I don't know, is there an animal that is that dynamic, that represents dynamic data or something? Let me show you an example of what these components do. So for example, um, <clears throat> let's say, Let's say I had a um, let's say I had a, a, a simple value, of the value of true, okay, and uh, and if I do if I put a data recorder here, um, and I connect it to the value of true, you guys can see that uh, the recorder is. You guys can see that the recorder is going to record that value only once, okay. And if I change this value to false, then it, now it, it records the value of false. And if I change it back to true, so if the value, the data that is coming into the recorder is changing, then it keeps adding that. Um, but something that can happen is that that value of true might be coming from a connection to an Arduino or to something, something that needs to be refreshing constantly. So for example, imagine, so if I put a timer in here, you can see that I'm mimicking the idea that this value true is being fed by a machine like very often. Like for example, like like a hundred like ten times every second. Two, 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 two. This is a very common situation when you have um, when you're communicating with, dif with different devices. And my computer is very laggy right now. I'm gonna stop this. Um, so yeah. So um, <clears throat> um so this is a very common scenario. So one of the things that these components do, for example, is I can create here a Boolean, I can create a gate. And what this gate is going to do is it's going to stop data from updating my grasshopper definition uh, unless the data has actually changed. So if I connect this here, you can see that now both components have nothing. Uh, but if I connect the timer here, you can see that um, the timer is going to update, but this component is not recording any data because the data is the same. It will only start recording it whenever this data changes. You see? So now true, false. And this component is basically stopping the flow of data going through. And it's not requiring that all the components that are connected to this keep updating once every second. It only lets data through when it changes. Okay, so I found that very useful for many applications. Um, I have, uh, well, anyway, I'm going to be publishing this very soon. I also have a data recorder, just like this one, but one that you can control with parameters as opposed to needing to use buttons, right? Um, so, um, so yeah, so I'm planning on publishing this. If you guys can help me with name suggestions, um, I will be very happy. Uh, <laughs> to name this after your suggestions. Um, okay. <clears throat> Can that panel provide timestamps for the data changes? Ah, that's actually a good, huh, timestamps. I'm going to write that here. That could be, uh, yeah, I like that. Uh, timestamps, timestamps for the ticks. Timestamps for the ticks. Yep, I'm going to create a component that just outputs whenever it's updated, it outputs the timestamp. That is very easy to do. Um, uh, have you decided on a fixed stream schedule hours? I have. Yes, I'm for now, I'm going to keep to I'm going to stick to Fridays at 10 a.m. as we have been doing. I think I messed up with uh, with this video. I think this video was scheduled for 7 p.m. or something. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm going to stick to that. Um, so Ham is asking, how can I link from generation in C sharp with environmental parameters? Um, I think there's a bunch of plugins there, Ladybug, Honeybee that help you with that. Otherwise, it's just a matter of like working with vectors and numbers and doing like, um, numerical calculations. Maybe we can do an example of that at some point. Um, <clears throat> Dynamo could be useful. No Dynamo. Uh, do you think Grasshopper more flexible for that from Dynamo or not? I think Grasshopper is a bit better if you are at the design stage. So if you're thinking about form, 
and logic and geometry and you want a flexibility. I think Grasshopper is a little better than that. And then better in that sense, I think Dynamo is much better when it comes to production. So if you already know what kind of building you're doing um, and you want to automate processes that are linked to Revit, I think Dynamo is a fantastic tool in that sense. So um, it depends a little bit of at which stage of your design slash production process you are. Um, will you show how to work with Kinect using C Sharp in Grasshopper, Hari Prashat? Um, I will probably not anytime soon because I don't have a Kinect in my apartment. Uh, <laughs> and these days that's a problem. Um, but, um, but I do have a real sense camera which can also do point cloud recognition. And I'm actually working right now and it will be part of this plugin um, to have real sense input and cloud of points. We won't have the nice skeleton, but you will have a point. So I, I will publish that at some point. Um, <clears throat> Tamors is asking for an interactive agent based design project, uh, C sharp, Python. Um, agent based simulations in general require <clears throat> require dynamic calculations or they require like update loops they required like the agents to keep checking on each other over over the course of time and um and grasshopper is not great at doing that because it doesn't have like an update cycle that keeps kicking in there are ways to mimic that um i may want to do a tutorial about that at some point i, I wrote like a ping pong like a ping pong game in C Sharp once, purely in Grasshopper. It was a lot of fun. Um, but uh, if you want to do serious agent-based stuff, you may want to move to a platform that has uh, out of the box. It gives you like a like a. It works at, It works with like update loops, like processing or like a or like a or or or, or playing C Sharp, I think. Um, name suggestion for the challenge is going to be attack on computational design. <laughs> Should I be wearing like a sword and a shield and a helmet? Let's attack computational design. Yay. Parametrical modeling of structures could be a good name. I actually do like parametric modeling of structures because it's a really good. So making like three dimensional trusses and beams and that kind of stuff is a really, really good exercise for understanding data, understanding lists and data trees in vanilla grasshopper. So I may want to do a series of a small series on that very soon. Um, if, if we're explaining, if I'm doing data trees. Uh, do you test Rhino Connect for a web-based deployment of the Grasshopper script? I have not tested that, um, um, but I may at some point. Parametric hijack. <laughs> um, Mark Hogan is asking when is it best to use script components or Grasshopper components? Uh, grasshopper components are great when you when you need to think through things uh, and if you are skilled with those uh, C sharp scripting in grasshopper is better when you need to do like serious geometry processing and you need a better performance um, so I would suggest that and also it's a good learning exercise uh, if you want to move from if you're if you've never coded and you want to move from regular vanilla grasshopper into the world of coding in general uh, C sharp scripting in Grasshopper is perhaps like a good middle ground, like a good middle place to start. <clears throat> Algorithmic modeling challenge, serious challenge. Algorithmic modeling challenge. That could be a good one. Algorithmic modeling challenge, because that also maybe it's not always buildings that we make. Maybe it's objects. Mm. I kind of like that. Algorithmic modeling challenge. Hmm. Okay. Uh, please don't forget to make the beginners tutorials in C sharp in Grasshopper. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll probably start. I'll probably start doing that at some point because I really need those as support material for my for my class. So. So yeah. Um, oh, can I show you? Can I show you something that I some code that I help a student of mine put together. Um, I have a student, Maran and Yubin. Uh, they're working on this app. They're working on this app where they have an iPad and they have this web browser where they can like draw geometry in 2D and they want Grasshopper to 
um, showcase to create out of those 2D polylines, they want to create three-dimensional geometry. So I, wrote, I helped them write like a very simple script with a small server that used WebSocket communication to go from processing, from drawing things in processing, to uh, displaying them in Grasshopper. Let me show you, let me show you that. That's kind of cool. Um, where, where are we? Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, I don't know what I am. Oh, where do I have those files? Oh, uh, here. Okay. So, yeah, so the first thing I'm going to do is here. All right, let me minimize this. I have a, I'm going to start, I'm going to start a um, web, so WebSocket server. Okay. This, sir, I have a server now that is running in the background of my computer and that allows processes to connect and um, and to um, and to, to establish communication between them. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a grasshopper file that uses the Bangesh plugin by Berus. I think I saw Berus somewhere before in the in the chat. It's a really good plugin. It has it has a lot of interesting stuff and it has a WebSocket client. Um, so with this client I am connecting to uh, I am connecting to this server, which means that my Grasshopper definition now is listening to uh, the server, to messages that are coming from the server. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open this processing sketch um, that I wrote and that also has a WebSocket client. Um, if it opens, my laptop is going to blow up. Um, so yeah, so it uses a WebSocket client. It opens up this drawing sketchboard of sorts. Um, and then here on the drawing board in processing, I can, I can, for example, draw this line. Boop. And you can see that what processing does is it sends this polyline via WebSockets to the server. And then the server sends that to my WebSocket client here in Grasshopper. So you can see that I get a JSON object with all those polylines, with all those points in the line. I do, I use JSON to parse the JSON object and to turn it into a list of points and then to replicate it, to draw it here uh, um, in Grasshopper. So I can now pop, 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 pop. <laughs> or I can clear it and then I can just, uh, you know, keep drawing stuff uh, like my face. <laughs> All right. Um, is this something that you guys find interesting, funny? Could we? Would you like me to spend some time actually breaking down how this, uh, how we made this? Um, I don't know. Um, just testing the waters here. Okay. Um, and um, and yep. Um, and I think with this. I'm probably going to call it a day. Uh, I have meetings all afternoon again. Um, so <laughs> I think people are liking this. <laughs> uh, oh, I should. Can I write on top of my, can I draw on top of my face? Wait, 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 wait. So if I. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. <laughs> uh, pa, pa, pa. Yay! <laughs> and uh, uh, what about some headphones? Ooh, whoop, whoop. I used to be a DJ, you know. Boop. <laughs> All right, I think I need to stop. <laughs> it's probably time to stop. <laughs> All right, um, 
Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna call it a day. Uh, I want to thank everyone who stuck who stuck around for so long. Um, I will I will chop this video and edit it and post it online at some point. Um, if anybody is up for giving a hand, uh, I would much appreciate that. Um, and um, and yeah, I guess I'll. I'll see you guys. I'll see you guys next week. Uh, don't forget to don't forget to subscribe uh, to the channel if you want to be updated to when new videos are coming in. And if you want to reach out, um, feel free to Instagram, Twitter, or send me an email. Okay. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good one. Bye bye.